Hello and welcome to today's CDCT live session. My name is Jason Rader and I'll be your moderator today for our topic on the big picture of IoT, the Internet of Things. With me today, we have three brilliant guys that are going to be having a conversation with me on this. We've got Juan Orlandini, our chief architect. We've got John O'Shaughnessy, uh, infrastructure architect and senior consultant. And we have Rob Parsons, our practice director for network and integrated security here at CDCT. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. So IoT, um, that's a big topic. And we, we know this. For, so for you folks out there, we have decided to kind of big picture this session, talk about the ecosystem, all of the things kind of that would be included in a conversation. And then actually, uh, we'd love for you guys to comment and let us know where, what particular angles we need to take in other sessions following this. Um, so with that being said, actually, Rob, I know that uh, one of the sessions we had been in previously, you talked about the number of IoT devices and the rapid increase of that. Do you, why don't you kind of set the stage related to that for us? Yeah, I mean, so the, the number of devices are really increasing much greater than the population. The, the population of the, uh, the internet consuming community is growing, but the, the number of devices is growing faster. So uh, that creates a huge challenge for us as technologists to have to uh, put all of the mechanisms in place to connect those devices or secure them or manage their data. And it's really that influx in devices that, that's driving a lot of what we're talking about today in, in IoT. Thanks, man. And I think, you know, for the folks out there, and again, I, I, we understand that the you folks in TV land have different levels and competency related to this, and we want to lead you through the discussion. So uh, again, for the, the C-level folks, as well as for the engineers to have a, a good, and we've got the right folks, I think, on this call to be able to lead that conversation. Juan, what else do you think we need to add before we kick in and start going down the, the ecosystem here? Well, it's also important to understand why there's that growth and explosion that uh, Rob mentioned. It, it's it's a number of different things. It's everything from your mobile devices that are now internet connected that can act as sensors for projects uh, to uh, instrumentation that's being put into places that we've never put in before. So there's instrumentation in the field. Uh, you, we literally are doing a project where we're helping a client count uh, uh, animals and in, uh, in a farm, right? We're doing projects where we're instrumenting stores and retail and, and gathering data around the products themselves, the clients in the pro in the, in the store. Uh, so there's a, a huge swath of uh, things that are possible, and it's and it's challenging because that's actually where our clients are struggling with this a little bit as well. Where should I start? What can I IoT? What should I get? And, and and that's part of the topic, right? Is how do you start get started on this, or if you've started, how do you make it better? And all of those are deep dives that we could uh, uh, talk about uh, as well. And then there's the technology that enables all that stuff as well. Of course. And John, I know that you've got probably ten or twelve IoT devices behind you. Uh, what do you think that a lot of folks are really? trying to figure out how they get into IoT or they're figuring out that they've been in IoT and now they need to kind of figure it out a little bit more. So what I get a sense of is people have their devices, whether it's things they've started with at home, like a doorbell that's automated or a camera where they can look in on their kid in the uh, nursery. Now they're thinking about what do they do with these things at work? And it's no longer two or three things in two or three rooms. It's hundreds, it's thousands. How do you manage all of that? How do you tie it together? How do you secure it? And how do you get value out of it? And I think that's, those are the big questions that we're starting to hear from our customers. Fantastic. So with that being said, I think all of us talked about devices. Let's, uh, let's kick it off and start uh, from that perspective. Devices. So we talked about you know ring doorbells or uh, those kinds of consumer-based things that we all kind of recognize within our homes. That's not the same stuff that's in an average manufacturing client's location, right? What, what else are we talking about? Well, there's, there's sensors of all, 
all kinds, all right? And so there's both the sensors themselves that are detecting something. So it could be motion, it could be temperature, it could be pressure, uh, could be rotational velocity of an engine. It could be lots of different things. So you have sensors that measure something and you're gathering that data, all right? And, and the important part on that one is it's important that you understand what your problem you're trying to solve. And then you have all of these sensors with different uh, capabilities that you need to bring to the table. Those sensors are then connected to some sort of a system that can either forward that data back to a, a, a centralized location, and it could be a cloud-based location, it could be a data center hosted location, or if it's uh, generating a lot of data, it's going to a, uh, a hub of some sort at the, at the field where it's getting processed. Uh, maybe you need to do some reactionary stuff that's re really quick that can't sustain the lag time between the edge and, and the centralized location. Or it might be where it's reducing the amount of data by pre-processing it and sending you only the valuable data back to uh, corporate. And there's there's all sorts of security implications with all that. How do you connect the sensors to that gizmo? How do you connect that gizmo to the corporate network? How do you make sure that your networks are enabled? There's also how do you provision these as you bring these on up uh, in new locations? There's there's lots of subtleties to that that need to be explored. And any other yeah, so devices? Yeah, thanks, Rob. If, if I could, one other to chip in that I, I see a lot now is really around cameras. You know, the there's just a multitude of different use cases around cameras from uh, people counting to PPE uh, management to, uh, you know, all of the life safety stuff that goes into it. And the, the big data and machine learning that's able to be applied on top of the the video streams to be able to extract information out that then we can make measurable business decisions based on from a camera stream is huge and it's it's got a, so many different angles and we see that uh being a starting point for a lot of folks in the iot world as they they start to acknowledge you know most we find are already there they're doing something um but those that are actively starting to and dip their toe in the water, a lot of times start with the camera and the, the different streams and information they can pull from that. And th those cameras actually work both with visible light, the stuff that we're sharing with each other right now, but they can work with infrared or other wavelengths. Uh, so you can measure different kinds of things. And one of the big things that's been happening this year, uh, for obvious reasons, has been thermal cameras, where you can actually see the temperature of uh, 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 <clears throat> a stream of people coming into a room or uh, a number of different things that actually are driving that uh, that uh, that need for, hey, let's make sure everybody stays healthy and distant and all that other stuff that ties into what Rob was talking about, which is the people counting plus distance uh, spacing and all that. So lots and lots of different sensors, lots of fun things we can do. So I, you know, we got to this point where ubiquitous access to processing and connectivity has allowed people to put processing and connectivity and data ingestion anywhere. Um, whether you need it or not, like your toaster, you know, I can't fathom why I would need it in my toaster, but I am certain there, there are connected toasters that exist out there. So then it's that whole, why, uh, you know, how do we use this thing? And I think that also the, the big I, as far as this, cause we got this whole, you know, things, but it's the whole internet of things, the, the connectedness of these things. And then maybe even the, the shadow IOT, uh, that has existed in your organization. I think one of the interesting use cases that I've seen is a fast food restaurant chain that goes through oil and they place sensors into their oil tanks so that when the levels got low, they didn't rely on an employee to check a gauge and phone somebody. The sensor got low, it tripped, and it automatically sent a signal over the internet to the provider to schedule the truck to come by and reload that oil with no human intervention in a way that hadn't been done previously. So again, there's a great use case for crazy little devices. The devices have been there for years, but now they're tying it all together. Beautiful, beautiful. And those are the kinds of things that make people's lives better because I'm sure that person, uh, their only responsibility wasn't to check the oil. It was somebody's collateral duty and I'm pretty sure it wasn't a, a wonderful process. You know, so I, there's all kinds of good that can come from leveraging these things from an efficiency perspective. It makes everybody better. Um, so then we let's talk more about the connectivity, guys, because I know you all 
we we're all sold on this, right? We we recognize that these things can be brilliantly deployed, but uh, on the back of the already existing infrastructure, is that a good strategy? <laughs> well, there's well, two, I'll, two I'll aspects to this. <laughs> uh, so, sorry, uh, Rob. Let me let me paint two pictures, and then I'll let you dig in because you're the expert on the networking side. All right. So uh, you mentioned two things. Uh, one is existing infrastructure. And there's two types of existing infrastructure we could talk about. One is uh, networks and compute that you might already have in, in a store location or on a factory floor or one of those kinds of things. Do you, do you want to uh, uh, piggyback on that? The other one is, is that there's a lot of what's called operational technology that's already been deployed. All right. So think of SCADA systems or think of uh, uh, door uh, locks that have been deployed that might uh, not have an IP address. Right. And now you want to actually measure that stuff for different things. So there's there's a, hey, do I take OT infrastructure and make it IOT or and also by which mechanism do I connect that, which is two different aspects. So so with that as a background, uh, Rob, maybe you can talk about the operational side of it or I mean, the connectivity. Yeah, absolutely. Side of it. So, so, I mean, we really have the collision of the 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 network, the IP networks and the OT systems that have been in place in legacy organizations and being able to collect data from those OT systems and bring it into uh, a mechanism where we can analyze it and drive value and thoughtful outcomes from it, I think is huge. Uh, but then when we talk about the infrastructure and how we we connect all these devices, uh, the the legacy systems that are out there are struggling to keep up and and really to uh, maintain reliability. A lot of the the sensors that are being deployed, much like the the systems that have been talked about so far, uh, you know, going back to John's example and whatnot, the there's a time based metric that's sensitive to acquiring that data and legacy networks may not be able to support that. So we're seeing more software defined. Uh, those centralized single plane of glass type systems are able to give us visibility and troubleshoot connectivity for IoT devices, which are often not the smartest devices in the world. They also they often have a single purpose to uh, extract a piece of information and then uh, put that on the network in a very simple way, but they may lose connectivity easily. They may not have the best Wi-Fi radio or other type of wireless radio that needs to interconnect. Uh, so the updates to management software that a lot of the software defined architectures give us, uh, give us the ability to make sure that uh, we're getting the most out of those, those, those older devices, those OT systems, but also the newer sensors that are coming in. Uh, so a lot more in the management side of things, uh, a lot more capacity on the wireless side of the network. Uh, so we, if we start talking about 802.11ac and uh, 5G and Wave 2 and all that good stuff that's out there, um, we're able to put more devices in a smaller space, which is definitely a point of sensitivity with legacy Wi-Fi networks as well. Uh, so, you know, modern networks are, are the the building blocks to being able to put a, a structured IoT environment together. So I'm not supposed to engage all in from an IoT perspective as from my dev side of the house if I'm not also connecting with the infrastructure side of the house. Is that what we're saying? Absolutely. So I expected a more emphatic yes than that, but yes. <laughs> so the answer yeah. is rich on that one, all right? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And this is one of those topics that we probably need to explore at a deeper length, right? Because you brought up the dev side of the house, is how do you enable your developer organization to uh, effectively and efficiently write code in a secure way that can be uh, easily pushed out to the edge and also have that be done securely? And then how do your devs get the instrumentation that they need in order to measure how effective the changes in the, uh, the, of the application that they've written is to measure the business value, right? There's a whole slew of that stuff. And there's actually a number of our partners that offer everything from 
uh, the development environments that the developers use to write the code. They might have to learn how to write new classes of code because it's an embedded environment. It's different than writing for a cloud or a, uh, a, a virtual machine or whatever, right? Uh, there's limitations, there's uh, CPU, memory, compute. Uh, there, there's all sorts of limitations that they might need to learn. But then there's the, the whole lifecycle management. How, uh, if, if I write it for in my test lab, and it works great here. How do I make sure that it's going to work when the distance gets stretched out? How do I make sure or that capacity is bigger than your test lab? That's exactly right, right? Because you might go from 10, you might go to 10,000. And there's a huge right. difference, right? And, and, and there's and then there's how do I make sure that if I'm doing 10,000 of these sensors in the field, that I can deploy them out securely in the field and have them self-register or register in a secure way and that the network and everything else is secured around it, right? So there's a developer forward view and then there's an infrastructure forward view and they got to make sure that you match both of them together. Yeah, I was having an interesting conversation with some folks on that topic recently where they were talking about just timeout values. When you've got a bunch of devices trying to send information and they were keyed to a certain timeout value and then they've got a lot of them, I mean, everything can completely fail when, when connections start dropping just because of the timeout. Uh, and that's an, a massive, you know, once you've got things deployed and having to, to to redeploy or update all of these devices, which is from a security perspective, another thing we'll probably talk about in a second, uh, that gets to be potentially a disaster. Um, so yeah, all a thoughtful look at the capacity, at the infrastructure, at the connectivity aspects, the devices themselves, their capabilities. Uh, you, you guys, I can't remember who brought it up, maybe Juan, maybe uh, Rob, but... Uh, and I was gonna throw this one to John. So we talked about o OT, we talked about um, SCADA systems a little bit. And I think it was Rob that was talking about connecting everything kind of together to get that good management view. But it sounds like when we start to get all excited about having a single pane of glass or, or being able to connect in, we're connecting two networks that weren't necessarily connected in the first place. And now we've run into another problem. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's, it's a key thing to understand where these systems are coming from and how to carefully put them together. You look at SCADA systems, perhaps running power plants. They've had instrumentation for years and decades, but they've always been air gapped. They've always been separated from things that attach to the internet. And that's been their um, reason to say, I don't need to worry about internet security. Well, now if we start saying we're going to pull data from those systems, we're going to tie them into corporate dashboards. Oh, and someone's just going to walk in the back room and connect this network to this network without thinking about it. That's where the big risks come in. So absolutely, you need to look at the pieces. You need to look at what the requirements are and you need to look at how safely you can pull them together. Well, and the good news on that is that it's it, it's solvable, right? Oh, yeah. It's actually doable, right? So uh, we keep on saying how hard and complicated this is, and it for sure is, all right? And so the message we're trying to give is not, not not don't do this because it's so complicated. The message is, is that there's there's these things to consider, uh, yep. but they're solvable problems. And, and, and there's been quite an amount of work that we've done to solve these things. So there's overlay networks, there's uh, uh, the stuff that Rob talked about, which is the software defined networks. Uh, there's network segmentation that could be brought into play. There's a whole bunch of different technologies. The important part is to understand which one makes sense in your case, right? And, and it meets your your business requirements. And, and that's, that's the challenge. It's not that the technology doesn't exist, it's that we got to make sure that you're leveraging the right technology for for your business needs. I love that. Like, and that yeah. true statement. Thank you. Like everything, just take the time to plan, understand where you want to go with it. And if you're careful about the implementation, it'll be just fine. It, the, the risk is something that's very exciting. People race to go deploy it without thinking about these downstream consequences. And that's where you, what you don't want to be in. You don't want to have to roll something back. You want to th figure it out planfully and execute your rollout plan properly. Yeah, no one's ever em embraced new technology quickly and, and run towards it from one side of the business and then everybody had to clean up after that. So we're, we're lucky in that respect. Oh, yeah. never, never, never. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's another thing that that brings up, which is important to point out, is that you got to make sure that you have the right domain expertise doing the right portion of that, 
all right? Uh, because it's easy to fall into the belief that you understand maybe a security model when you're not a security person, right? Yeah. It's easy to fall into understand that you actually understand radio when you're not a radio person, right? And, and, I mean, we all have Wi-Fi in our home, so I think I know Wi-Fi, but I don't know squat of Wi-Fi compared to our, uh, our radio experts, all right? And so developers that might make an assumption about functionality when they're in a lab actually will have problems when it goes into the field unless they engage those experts, right? Uh, developers that might secure something in the lab will probably run into smack into the face of security when you try to deploy it uh, into production, right? So make sure that you get, get the right domain expertise involved throughout the life cycle and maybe the DevOps is the right thing or whatever it is, just make sure you have the right experts involved. Now you brought up something really interesting that I want to kind of toss out there to folks because I think a lot of people are solving this right now with off the shelf stuff, right? They're, they're getting this, they're getting this, they're getting this. And then when they read the label, if you will, or the marketing, it says, you know, secure or all of the, the buzzwords that, you know, people, the marketing folks would be remiss if they didn't include, but, uh, you know, because it says secure on this product and secure on this product, if we deploy them by default, obviously we're going to be fine, right? <laughs> so, uh, you you made a funny uh, <laughs> yeah che uh, checking boxes off on a list laundry list of have do you have one of these is probably not the right approach right and, and that's marketing's job right and, and and there's no slide on marketing they're doing their job is make sure that you have all the check boxes included be careful right? they're listening i i know i'm walking <laughs> a fine line here right uh <laughs> um but you do, and it ties into exactly what we we're talking about before, which is the domain expertise. It's like, hey, this checkbox is there, but how does that match up to this checkbox over here, right? And do they really match up to each other, right? And there's there's a lot of careful consideration, especially as you're going into regulated environments. Uh, and if you're in healthcare, oh boy, you got to make sure that you have all, not just the checkboxes, but all the dotted lines filled in, right? And there's I's and need to be dotted, T's that need to be crossed, and umlauts with the two U's. Uh, the two dots above them that need to be dotted as well, right? Uh, if you go into power, if you go into transportation industries, they all have regulations and you need to be a domain expert in those as well. So it's important that you engage somebody that's actually worked in those fields so that you don't accidentally get yourself into trouble, right? Yeah, it's funny when you're building a house and you install electric or, you know, build another part of it, somebody's got to come and check it out before you're allowed to occupy it. There is no anything like that in a lot of cases. And, you know, just because it seems to be stable or secure or have the right amount of power to it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that's true. And the worst time to find out is when you're living in it, right? Um, so I think regardless of whether we're talking security or infrastructure, and we there's tons of great intentions out there. I, I don't think anybody's deployed IoT maliciously in their organization. I think they've done it to to solve some problems, right? But it was they maybe did it in a bubble and maybe got patted on the back for solving that problem, but it potentially created another bottleneck or issue somewhere else. We, we've actually seen that. And in fact, some of the ransomware that's happened in uh, some large organizations uh, came in not through IT's infrastructure. It came in through cash registers or it came in through bank uh, ATM machines or it came in from a, a different way that you might have not expected to see. And it was none of that was uh, intentionally created to cause a hole in the network or a hole in security mm -hmm. stance. But it sure was, right? And malicious actors are absolutely going to go pursue that and, and try and poke you in every corner and every crevice that you create for them. Well, and you I mentioned what, security go, uh, and segmentation just in in one line uh, a bit ago, right. Juan. And I just want to come back to segmentation with that okay. line of discussion. So, uh, you know, the, the need for segmentation is more than ever here with uh, all of the different systems and we we don't necessarily want that cash register to be able to talk to a print server and that print server to be able to talk to you know a payroll database and, and so on so we need to carve up the the existing environment in a way that uh, is logical for the both the the applications and the way they need to work but also the way data flows between those systems and 
you know, you, you start to hear the term zero trust thrown around and there's a lot of different levels, I think, that you can address this at, you know, the extreme being zero trust where you don't let anything go unless explicitly permitted. Uh, but there's also the the maybe gentler approach to start to segment some critical systems. You know, you you segment what what's absolutely critical. So think about finance, think about payroll, think about um, company IP, you segment that stuff in the data center or in the cloud, make sure it's secure. And then you start to segment some of the higher risk stuff. So maybe it's some of the Wi-Fi devices or IoT devices that maybe aren't hardened and maybe it's the printers and you start to keep that stuff away from the sensitive stuff. And it's, it's really, you know, we've talked about this is complex but doable and this is where we wind up getting really engaged with our clients is helping to understand the different uh, data types that are on their inv in, on their systems, the different user types, who needs access to what, and then being able to logically segment in a way that that gives them all the access that they need while really reducing that risk footprint. And you know, Jason, I know that security is more your world, but uh, you know. That's where we start from a, a network segmentation perspective, and I'm sure you've got more to add on the, the security side of the house as far as how you could take it to the next level. No, I appreciate the setup. I, I think we kind of, when we were talking about devices and then connect it, connectivity, and then we kind of went into management and security, we skipped over something you just brought up, which I think is very critical, is the data. Um, the devices themselves, do they store the data? They're creating data, The and, and I think John actually had brought up earlier, the the regulatory requirements related to that data. Uh, but I mean, data in and of itself is, uh, we could have a, an entire conversation related around that data that's created, how it's regulated, how it needs to be stored, transmitted, all of that stuff. Uh, that again, trying to solve a business problem with a, an IoT type device, um, there's a lot more of a conversation related to the data that it's creating and processing and, 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 and where that is stored. And, and then we can also talk about the economics of that as well. Yeah. Well, there's another aspect to that, right? And, and it's a it's a it's a different angle, right? And we've touched on this in the previous in, uh, segment on AI and how you generate value for the right, right. and all that. As you have all of this data that's being created, and then how do you get business intelligence? How do you uh, out of it, right? And, and how do you become a data driven organization, which is what uh, what a lot of organizations are trying to get to, right? And, and that's really important that we explore that. And I don't think this is the right. Uh, context, but just throwing it out there, that that's something that we you know, we should probably have a conversation and would love to hear from the audience if, if you'd like for us to dig into, which is how do you generate new revenue streams, increase your revenue streams? Uh, uh, how do you uh, present the data in a way that lets you make smarter and quicker decisions? Uh, and that, that's a whole different subject. And we have a bunch of experts on that side of the house that I'd love to bring into this forum to have that conversation around. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because we have been talking about it for the most part about IoT that was out there and kind of unwrangled, if you will. What you're talking about is a very thoughtful way to deploy devices to gather that data uh, to then enrich it and you know make us better. And I think that definitely deserves a, a little more, uh, maybe a session in and of itself. Hey, let us know, guys. So let's dig into something else that we haven't talked about uh, quite uh, in quite amount of detail. Uh, and, and that's uh, so we've talked about that. There's the sensors and the devices and then there's the processing. Right. And what we haven't talked about is where that processing should be done. Right. Should you uh, approach this from a uh, cloud hosted cloud enabled approach? Or does it make sense for you to do it in an on-premises infrastructure? Which which one is is the right choice? And, and there's no wrong answer to this, right? It's finding out which one is the more right answer, right? And, so, and, oh, I was going to say. So now we're taking a a topic that's a little scary, like IoT, to some people, and now we're saying cloud in the same conversation. <laughs> Part of the conversation. <laughs> right. So I'll tell you this. All right. Here's here's my perspective on it. There's a lot of IoT use cases. Uh, that do not necessarily generate a ton of data. If you're not doing video, if you're not capturing uh, x-rays or imaging or lots of those kinds of things, you, you can generate tons of data, but you can process it and manage it effectively uh, without a lot of storage costs associated with it, all right? 
<clears throat> there, that tends to be very easy and very cost effective to do in the, in the public clouds because the public clouds give you amazing tools for the development uh, side of the house. Right. They give you all of the tooling so you can have the pipe and the DevOps pipeline to build the stuff, to deploy it, to secure it, to manage it in the field. Um, Azure's got a, an amazing set of tools, GCP, AWS, they all, right? Uh, where we start seeing that there's a decision that might need to be made is if you have tons and tons of data. And if you don't manage that data effectively, the public cloud can become pretty uh, pretty expensive. And it's not wrong, it's just uh, it, it, you gotta be very uh, careful about that. So we've seen a set of clients that have actually said, hey, I, I get so much data, I'm not uh, managing it effectively quite yet. Or, or I have some regulatory requirements that mandate that I keep it for a long time or in a secure location. Not that the cloud is not secure, but it's just uh, lots of different ways, all right? Sure. Um, and, and we're seeing those folks make a decision to run it on premises. Well, if you do that, then you lose the benefit of the cloud, which is all of that tooling that I just talked about, right? The development okay. tooling, the deployment tooling, all that other stuff. And that's when you have to look outside of uh, uh, to an ecosystem. And there's other partners that we have uh, that have that ecosystem that is not public cloud hosted. So it's not an, uh, and some of them actually do both. So it's not an or statement, it, 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 potentially an and statement where some of the data goes to the public cloud for the awesome things it does. Some of it goes on premises for the stuff that it's best suited for. So you gotta be kind of careful and make sure that you, you understand how uh, your data is being used, what tools you're gonna use, uh, your cost metrics and all that before you make that decision of where you're gonna run this, uh, this thing. So John, you're on the front lines, right? What kind of questions or what are people coming to you, you know, to ask? Or do they feel like they've got a lot of this stuff sorted out and they just want you to kind of handle the connections? Or are they coming to you to kind of tell us the big picture? Where, where do you find, are you helping them get across the line or are you helping them strategize? It, it's more on the strategy side, at least what I see. We, we've got the whole, you know, I know there's all this IoT stuff. What should I do with it? It seems like a good idea, but they're That's just good. starting at that point. They don't have the whole picture. And so it gets back to all the things we've talked about. How do you figure out how to get value out of it? What's the real business value? How do you figure out how to deploy it securely? And again, one of the things that that often leads into, like Rob mentioned is, if they haven't discussed it already, now's the time to really get serious about network segmentation so you can understand how to safely deploy this stuff. And it doesn't just help at that point, it helps them ongoing. So there's a whole picture of what do we do here? And, and that's where, at least where I see it, is with customers going, I think there's something here. I think there's something to this IoT stuff. I don't know really how to get there. And that's what we try to help them with. Nice, I appreciate that. Actually, I found the stat I was looking for. 64 billion IoT devices by 2025 is the prediction. Um, 64 billion. I mean, one of those two of those billion. I was help. just going to say. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but, but that's the thing is this, uh, this is not something, it's not a fad. Uh, it is something that I think as, you know, more and more, think of the productivity that we've had in the last few decades with, microcomputers on desktops to be able to allow our users to work more. And now with the ability to get these devices that can process, that can uh, create data, that can store data, that can, uh, we can process at the edge. We have a lot of different, you know, some of the breakthroughs that we've made right now in AI and some of the other places are simply because we have the processing power to do all the calculations that we need to. So now we're really sitting on the edge of the next big thing. And I think it's definitely gonna include these devices that we're calling IoT now. Will we continue to call them that? I'm not sure. But it's one of those things where these types of devices are really gonna make a big difference and having some kind of strategy to John's point uh, of how we're gonna ingest that. And then not trying to do it all yourself. Uh, I think, you know, one of, we talk about this a lot, one uh, on our other sessions is where, you know, I can, you know, I've got smart guys that work for me. So, hey, we'll just figure it out and we'll go out and do it. But, you know, even if you did figure out how to do it at that expert level, uh, you're only going to be able to monetize it that one time as opposed to having some folks, you know, where we try to position ourselves is to be those guys that you can come to uh, where it gets kind of complicated. And this is one of those things where it gets kind of complicated. It, it does. I mean, even uh, so talk about the processing on the edge, right? Yeah. Uh, we have a, a group that 
all, all they do is focus on what is the right platform to do that processing at the edge. And there's a, there's a plethora of uh, products that are out there. Everything from these little bitty boards that are about that big that can do processing on them. And they're remarkably powerful, right? Um, to uh, boxes that are a little bit bigger that have more time and more compute power than my desktop did just a few years ago, right? Yep. Where you can actually do some AI based inferencing or even training at the very edge. So you can literally put these on trains. You can put these on, uh, on automobiles. You can put these on scooters for all you, all, all that it matters. Their power envelope is so low that uh, you can do amazing computation at the edge, but with that comes like, hey, hey, I can do all of this. What should I do? Right. And it ties right back into the what are you trying to solve for your business to John's point? Uh, can uh, can we derive value from it? And if it can, then it's worth exploring and trying. Right. So uh, it, it, it's, it can be complicated. But your point about making sure that you have a, a partner that has uh, at least explored the possibilities or many of the possibilities uh, and help you cull down your choices a little bit. That that uh, that is a lot of value in and of its own. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, guys. It has been a very fun conversation. Definitely one that we're going to have to continue. So I hope that you'll all come back and uh, we can talk more about this stuff. Any parting words from any of you guys? Words of encouragement? Where to start? Just take note of what you want to get out of this and use that as your starting point, and we'll help you fill in all the rest. Fair enough. Well said. I'll, I'll, I'll tie, I'll tie into that. And, uh, I'll, this is a general recommendation around many things is start with a smaller project, get a quick sure. proof of value for that smaller project. If that value, uh, if you can get that value, then grow from there. If you start off with these grandiose schemes, they tend not to work so well. So start small, prove the value, expand, and then embark on the next one. Because I, I suspect that once you have one of these in place, you're going to want to do it again and again and again. And there's a lot of learning that your organization can go through, through that process of making sure that you're doing the business value first. Love it. Thank you. And again, we understand what the folks out there are going through. We, uh, you know, support you and all of those things that you do where, you know, kind of establish the fact that we, you know, we care about the community at large and we want to get, help you guys get across the line. But thanks everybody for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, if you got any comments related to the video, please feel free to do so. And again, you'll direct how we take the next step in this journey. Uh, I'd love to thank my guests, John, Juan, and Rob. Thank you guys so much for being here. And if you'd like to know more about what we do at CDCT, please visit us at insightcdct.com. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone.